Welcome to another episode of the Not Almost There podcast. I'm Joe Churro, your host, and we have a very special show today because I am in real life with a human being, an actual human being, not a virtual meeting, and I have John Brooks next to me who is a health and wellness expert, and he is my jujitsu coach, and we are currently in our jujitsu gym in Naperville, Illinois. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me. Now, I know you have a ton of credentials, and I don't want to mess them up, so why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is John Brooks. I am a nutritionist. I have a Master of Science in Nutrition and Wellness. Uh, I'm a certified sports nutritionist to the International Society of Sports Nutrition, and I'm also Precision Nutrition Certified. Um, yeah, those are the, you know, just my credentials, my background, and, you know, as we always talk, right, I don't like to use those as, hey, listen to me because of that. I like to rely on evidence to dictate the things that I do, as well as my experience. So we're here to talk about how to get ripped in your 40s. And there's something I want to demystify, that the older you get, the more impossible it gets to get ripped and to get really into shape like you could have when you were in your 20s. Is that true? Uh, no, I have plenty of clients who you know, have been able to achieve better conditioning um, as they're older, because, you know, with age, like most things, right, we get smarter, so we start to do things more efficiently, right? We all wish, well, we can go back when we were 20. Um, but purely from just the physiological standpoint, when we look at what we refer to as your resting metabolic rate, the amount of calories you burn, um, age is the variable that actually plays the smallest role, you know? So the things that we look at are going to be your age, your height, your body weight, your lean body mass, and when we plug and play with the variables, I show clients like, hey, here's where your uh, resting metabolic rate was. And this is just the amount of calories it takes for you to be you at rest. So think about starting your car, letting it run and leaving it in park, right? Your cell turnover, you maintaining a constant body temperature. Um, but anyway, when we look at it, when you say 20, 40, 60, that range is, is very small. And clients are always surprised, like, wow, age really doesn't matter that much. And you know, I always joke, and it's like, it's not like your heart stops you know, when you, as you age. So, from that standpoint, it doesn't play much of a role at all. Like I said, it has the least impact, um, number one. Number two, the one thing I would say is sometimes people will have maybe um, apprehension about working out because they think, you know, if you're always told you're too old, you're too old, well, you will be, right? It's completely self-fulfilling. And this isn't to say that, okay, maybe you had some injuries or something from when you were younger, you should just run and go sprinting and, you know, go crazy and stuff, no you can adjust what you're doing to accommodate for the fact that, okay, maybe I had those injuries, but you could still get in great and better shape, right? You just do other stuff, you know? There's so many safe ways to do it that, you know, we can dive into later. So just in a nutshell, no. And, 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 it, and I'm not just saying that so you don't think it. It's, I mean, the evidence shows. It's just not true, right? And even when we look at like professional sports, you know, how many athletes now are succeeding into their late 30s and early 40s in sports that are very physically demanding, you know? So one of the things that you, you taught me is that you can't outwork a bad diet. When you look at overall health, and if you are one of these people that want to get into shape or take your game up to that next level, what percentage or is there a percentage to calculate how much you should focus on diet versus like working out and fitness? Yeah, that's a great question. So often, you know, I hear this a lot in my industry and from people I respect, they'll say, oh, it's 95% it's diet, 5% exercise or you know, 80, 20 or, or whatever it is. And, you know, the truth is nobody really knows what the percentage is, right? Because it's, I, I don't even know how we would research that. But in my opinion, both are very important. Um, and, and often what happens is if, say, you eat a bad meal, right? You can imagine something you eat and you overeat it. Right in the short term, you're not going to want to go work out, right? Because you're going to be like, oh, I just don't feel good. Why would I want to work out, right? Um, not even go for a walk because you overeat, right? So that would be one thing. So short term, there's going to be that effect. And then in the long term, you just don't feel as good because you don't have as much energy and things like that. And it's not just the food per se. It's also, you know, your body composition. If you're carrying around excess body fat, well, your resting metabolic rate is actually higher. So you're less efficient, right? So you're burning more calories at rest. And one of the biggest things I hear when people, you know, lose body fat is they'll say, oh, wow, I have so much more energy. I don't need that nap in the afternoon. And yes, they're eating better, but also their heart isn't pumping against as much resistance at rest, right? So that energy goes somewhere so you can allocate it elsewhere. So I think they go hand in hand. The people that have the most success and are the most consistent do both, right? They take care of their eating and they take care of their exercise and, and they generally have um, good habits, right? Because the habits will drive you towards your goals, right? And just in, in a nutshell, you know, my approach, and I'll just cover it shortly here, is, 
you know, I aim to get my clients roughly 80% of their energy intake from what we would consider nutrient-dense sources. The other 20% is whatever you want, but the quantity matters, right? So the, the whole, the 100% matters. Um, so when I say 80-20, I don't mean just, yeah, eat all your good stuff and then whatever you want for the final 20%, but the, the 100% total matters because we still need an energy deficit to lose body fat. And I remember when I was uh, working with you, and I still work with you, but when we were first going, I just had this craving for Twizzlers, as, as funny as that is, but not like 95% of my diet was really intact. And you're like, go eat your four or five Twizzlers. It doesn't really matter. So that's kind of what you're talking about. Exactly, right? In the grand scheme of things, if you really zoom out, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. And, and if you get too rigid, especially with food avoidance, it's just not a good predictor of long-term adherence. And the number one predictor of whether or not you, you succeed, independent of whatever diet you're following, is adherence. You know, if you can adhere, and, and say it, it, it puts you in an energy deficit, you'll lose body fat. The question is, can you do it in the long term? So w one of the things that you talked about is your, your metabolic rate. And I know that the, the base of this is to get your, your basal metabolic rate first before you figure out your activity levels to start to calculate what calories you need to have on a daily basis, and then what deficit you want to create to lose weight, let's say. And I'm sure a lot of people, most people want to lose weight in some way. So what is the first step that you do for your clients or for yourself when you're trying to calculate the, the basal metabolic? Sure, great question. So I use equations, and these are validated equations that we use. And when I say these equations are validated, what we've done is we've put, you know, and I say we, the researchers, right, the larger community, we have what are called metabolic chambers, and there's like 30 of them in the world. And these are sealed rooms where we can measure exactly how many calories people burn at rest, right? How much oxygen comes in, how much CO2 is going out. We know down to the calorie. And then we have equations that can accurately predict what we're going to see in a metabolic chamber because the idea that everyone can go in one is just not the case. And once we account, so let's just say we've, we have a, a, another male, same age as you, same height, same weight, his resting metabolic rate is going to be pretty much the same as yours, right? So I always tell people you're not special, right? And, and I mean that in, in a positive manner, right? Because we're all similar once we account for those things. So I plug the variables into these equations, calculate, hey, here's what your resting metabolic rate is, here's what you burn at rest. And most people are surprised. They say, I burn that much? I'm like, yes. Because a lot of people have like the fitness trackers and they only look at their activity calories, but they forget about the, you know, the resting metabolic rate part of it, right? So, um, so that's part one. And then, you know, from there, we, we get an idea of what their activity level is, right? So we make an estimate on, okay, how, many, how much are they burning in terms of exercise? And, you know, a big variable there is going to be intensity and as well as your body size, right? That's going to, you know, a bigger person doing the same activity burns more than the smaller person. Um, and then the other variable is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. This is all the activity you do from the moment you get out of bed that isn't exercise, right? So um, some people you might know are like busy bodies, right? They're constantly moving. They never sit still. You know, and they tend to be kind of lean, right? Because throughout the day, they actually burn a lot of calories because they just, they don't sit still. So those are the variables that we look at and kind of plug and chug. And then we get what you burn, your total daily energy expenditure. And then we say, okay, well, let's set a deficit 20, 30% less than you burn. And let's try and sustain this to lose body fat. One of the most profound things that I learned from working with you was that I shouldn't focus on the daily. Well, you should have daily goals, sure. but it's really the week. And how the program was structured for me was I had a daily allotment of calories, and those were broken down into macros, which I want to talk about in a little bit here. But then on the weekend, the way I crafted the, the program was I had some, some extra calories. So I think those extra calories either broke me even with my resting metabolic rate plus my activity level, but then during the week I would have a deficit. Is that pretty common to focus on the week and not necessarily a per day? Yeah, so the, the, the logic behind that is, is multifold. Number one, um, let's say you had a bad meal, and this is one of the things we discuss. Sometimes when people fail, right, they look at a meal that they overeat something, let's just say it's during the week, and they say, oh, that's it, I'm done, I, I can't do this, you know, I'm not disciplined, or I don't have willpower, you know, they do that whole thing. And, you know, what I'll say is, look, it was one meal, let's zoom out, let's look at what you burned for the week, right? Let's just say you burned 21,000 calories in the week, and you overate, right? You ate a 1,500-calorie meal, okay. We're still good, right? You can, you can get right back on and, and get moving and, and embrace that failure, as, if you will, to step back and, and make mental note of, hey, how did I feel after I ate that? And just start noticing that stuff, right? Just from a mindful standpoint. And that'll kind of help change your relationship with food. But 
within that context, like I was saying, is you don't want to A, get caught up in the binary thinking, think of it in total for the week. And then the reason for the weekend, why do we maybe put you into energy balance or maybe not as significant of a deficit, give you a little bit of a mental reprieve, right? Not that you can't, you know, there could be periods of time where you just keep a linear deficit all the way through. But I do find, especially when, you know, people have kids or, you know, just some kind of social life, you might want a little bit more to work with. So what I say is, hey, let's not do the cheat day where we just say, hey, you earned it, you can eat whatever you want. Because A, that reinforces bad habits. Um, B, you could eat into your deficit, right? Let's say you've accumulated a, a 5,000 calorie deficit during the week. It's not that hard to eat into that over the weekend if you just let yourself go. And, and there's a lot of physiological factors that will drive you to do that, right? Your body wants to maintain body mass. Remember, there's, there's a part of your brain that's driving you to do that. So by saying, hey, let's, let's eat an energy balance, you know, you, there's no reason to overeat, but you, you, know, you don't have to undereat either. You get that mental break, it resets your satiety signals. And, and it's mainly for those reasons that I always offer that as, a, as an option for people. And, and you could take it or leave it kind of thing. If you don't want to and you want to sustain a deficit, that's okay too. And then for those of you who are worried about losing muscle or something like that, you know, that's a good kind of way too to ensure, okay, let's, let's go ahead and um, you know, fill up our glycogen levels or stored carbohydrates basically is what that is and um, ensure that you're feeling good going into the week. Where do you see most people go wrong? Because I know for myself, I would do really good during the week and then Friday comes, you wanna have this reward. You wanna kind of pat yourself on the back for saying, I stuck with my diet, I worked out, once or twice a day, and then all of a sudden you order your pizza, you have a couple beers, and of course today's beers are so caloric, like IPAs, then all of a sudden you're, you find yourself on Monday not moving the needle at all. Do you find that pretty common? Yeah, there's, so there's a, like you said, there's a few things that happen, right? If, if you just kind of let it go and relax too much on the weekend, that can happen. And, and the truth is, if you just kind of stick with the tracking and kind of see, okay, let me just get up to energy balance, you'll be okay. Now, some of the weight that people do gain, let's just say on the weekend, it's not body fat. Sometimes it's just the weight of the food, there's sodium. Um, also, I, I reference glycogen. That's just stored carbohydrates in your, in your muscles and liver. And, and the way I try and explain this in a simple manner is, imagine weighing a dry sponge and then soaking it in water and weighing it, it's gonna weigh more. That's kind of what happens when you, you, know, you fill up, right? When your you know, carbohydrate intake increases, it's not body fat, it's glycogen. And it's actually performance enhancing. It's good for you in that sense. But your muscle bellies get full, your liver gets full. And for every gram of glycogen you lose or store, you lose or store three grams of water. So that weight can come off very quickly, right? Like if I work with like a weight contest athlete, if I have like a UFC fighter, you know, that's the weight, that's how these guys can drop 20, 25 pounds within a, you know, a week, right? It's just from manipulating glycogen and sodium levels and things like that. And that's just wringing out a sponge and you know, re, reintroducing it. So I tell people, don't, don't get caught up in that. And, and one thing I want to mention briefly just about the scale, is sometimes people get really bugged out by the scale. And this is going to sound counterintuitive, but sometimes for those people, instead of weighing in once a week, because let's say you weigh in and, and you, you, you don't lose any weight because you weigh in on Friday morning and Friday morning. But if you would have weighed in Saturday morning or Thursday morning, you would have saw maybe a two pound weight loss, but it just so happened on that Friday you didn't for a variety of reasons, that might mess with your head. So sometimes weighing in every morning and just taking a seven day average can be helpful too, right? If, if the scale kind of bugs you out or something, you know, and that's just one measure. There's other ways that you can, you know, measure your progress, you know, waist measurements, things like that. That's exactly what I do. I weigh myself. The first thing I do in the morning is I go to the scale and I, I weigh myself. Well, what I, what I noticed to your point is crazy fluctuations like to the tune of like eight or nine pounds in a day yeah so how do you know your real weight yeah so it's kind of a question of your real weight relative to what the the variables are um say like on a friday morning versus a monday morning right so you can kind of compare those two data points because they're going to be different assuming you're eating more over the weekend to get into energy balance um, so, and then you could just average it. I would say the best thing to do is say, I don't know, what is my real weight? I, I would just average it. And you know, you're a bigger guy and you're lean and you have a lot of muscle. So your weight can fluctuate more than say somebody with more body fat. Because body fat doesn't have a lot of water, right? So you either, you either lose it or you store it kind of thing, right? Whereas this, this kind of short term weight can kind of fluctuate quite a bit. And I find that the, the leaner and the more muscle somebody has, the more we can see that fluctuate. And then just to mention for, for females out there too, your endocrine system can play a really big role in that. So if you're you know, nearing your menstrual cycle, you know, there's gonna be a big effect on the scale. So for sometimes in those cases, I say don't even weigh in around that time, just stay away from it because I don't want it to you know, mess with you and stuff and it, it might make you, um, 
go crazy and it's just water, right? And you know, you're, you, and you don't want that to, to bother you and stuff. So I like A, for people to take like pictures every couple months, I think that's good for them to have. And then just, you know, girth measurements, those are always good too. Um, because that'll show, okay, my waist is getting smaller, and you know, that kind of thing. And I, f I find that that's helpful for people. So I, you gave me some really good advice too, and this would probably help people if they're going on vacation or they want to take that after shot, which I'm going to post some of my before and after pictures to show you what following a very doable program can do. And if I could do it, trust me, you can do it as well. But one of the things that, that you told me is uh, reduce my water intake, not crazy where you're not drinking water, but reduce it. So whatever I was drinking at the time, I was drinking a gallon of water. And in my case, because of the program I was on, I actually had to drink two gallons of water a few days before just to reduce it to a gallon to wean off to a half gallon. And then also reducing the, the salty foods. Um, and those two things alone, just by not having those for two days or reducing my water intake, I was able to drop five pounds and really kind of squeeze out that sponge. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's something we'll do sometimes, you know, with like fighters, for instance, you know, we do a whole trick where we load them with water and sodium and then bring it down. But yeah, generally I, I like to think of it like landing a plane versus crashing it. Right. So we, all I told you, I think was just, just cut your water intake in half cut your salt intake roughly in half. You know, like if you were salting stuff, just don't salt it and keep it simple like that. And your body will respond accordingly because there's a lot of mechanisms your body has that regulates how much water is in your system because it plays a role in your blood pressure, right? So if you just say, oh, I'm gonna cut all of it out for like five days or something, well, then you're gonna hold on to everything because your body's going to try and maintain balance, right? So just keep it simple, kind of cut it in half. And like you said, if you have like a short-term kind of something where you wanna feel really good and stuff, that could be one way to attack it for sure. Great. So I want to go back a second to macros mm -hmm. because one of the things I noticed is the significant impact of fat and how fat is so caloric that you can easily go over your daily allotment by concentrating on or by having meals with, with too much fat. And one example of that was filet, like I love that cut of steak. So I would have a filet mignon and it, it, in my head, I would always think, well, this is a really lean cut of beef. There's like no fat on here. And then when you, when you look it up, it's really almost half fat. I mean, even though it's a lean cut of meat, the, those fat grams equate to a lot of calories. So when you create these macros, which I wanna get into in a second, <laughs> I would, I would, anytime I would have like a lean cut of beef, I would go over my fat grams for that day because I would have a protein shake and that had some fat in it. And then I would have my, my lunch and that would have, have some, some fat in it, which made me start to realize that I need to reduce my red meat intake completely. Um, and, and I did and it helped me. Contrast that to keto, which I did a couple years ago, it was, it was completely different, but it was a very, keto was a very short-term thing. So again, another topic in, for, for a few minutes from here, but I want to get into the to macros. So you have your, your base metabolic rate, then you have your activity levels. Now from there you take it and you break those down into what's called macros. Can you explain that? Yeah, so the, the, the total daily energy expenditure, we break down into your resting metabolic rate. That's you starting the car, leaving it in park. Um, we have your activity. And then we have your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So like the nature of your job, are you walking around a lot? Are you, you know, if you're a carpenter, you know, you're gonna be doing a lot versus say sitting at a desk, right? Um, and then also the thermic effect of food. And this is just the idea that, you know, you don't absorb 100% of the calories you eat, roughly 8% is lost just from the cost of digesting food and breaking it down, right? So we work from there and then we set the deficit. So, you know, you referenced fat and, you know, fat is a little more than twice as energy dense as carbohydrates and protein. There's about nine calories per gram versus for. And this is not a good thing or a bad thing. I, I, I don't put a value judgment on it. It just is, right? It's just that when you are tracking, you do notice if you eat something with, say, a protein to fat ratio of one to one, right? Say you eat 30 grams of protein, you pick up 30 grams of fat, you know, that's going to be pretty energy dense, right? So if you choose leaner cuts of protein, it's going to give you more flexibility, right? So that's, that's number one. Now, it's not that you can't have a fatty cut of protein. It's just that if you do, you need to plan accordingly, right? Maybe the rest of your day would be, okay, I'm just gonna consume leaner proteins, right? To account for that so that I get to my, um, to my goal for protein, you know, which we could touch on the, the wisdom 
um, behind that. So that's something that you learn to pay attention to. And, and, and there's a little bit of interchangeability between fat and carbohydrate intake that we could dive into. But yeah, generally speaking, um, if you're gonna have a fattier cut of protein in one meal, you know, you wanna account for that by kind of choosing some leaner ones throughout the day. So how do people break down their macros then? Generally. Sure, sure. So for me, if I'm putting together number one, there's going to be a range of protein intake that we're going to aim for. Because, um, you know, most of the people I'm working with are, are active and, and we want to ensure that they're getting enough protein to benefit from their training, right? Because we usually the limiting factor to people fully um, realizing their, their gains, if you will, is going to be protein intake on a consistent basis, optimal protein intake. So think like you're building a house and you're using bricks and you only have 80% of the bricks to build a house. Well, you, you shorted yourself 20%. That happens a lot. People work out, and then they don't take in an optimal amount of protein to fully realize their gains, because you're made of protein, right? Your hair is keratin, your skin is collagen, your muscles are actin and myosin. For your body to be able to build these body proteins, we need an exogenous source, an outside source of protein, and that's where your food comes into play. So once we've covered the basis for protein, and again, there's a, there's a range there that we can work within, and some of that'll be preference-based. Um, and, and as well as we look at the, the lean body mass of the individual too to set that. And then from there, we need a certain amount of fat coming into your system for your endocrine system to work properly. And then there's some lipoproteins in your body that are needed. Um, but then once we cover that, there's gonna be a little bit of a buffer and it's just energy to your body. And from there, the rest can go to carbohydrates. And it's pretty much comes down to preference as to what percent goes to fat or carbohydrates in so far as your diet. So the two bogeys I tell people to generally look at is, hey, let's look at your protein intake and your total calories. These are the two that we want you to hit. And when I say hit these, when people track, I'm saying within 10%. We're not trying to be perfect or anything like that because um, that'll just drive you, excuse me, that'll drive you crazy. And, and just to touch on too, you know, I think a lot of people will hear, they'll hear us talking, they'll think calorie counting, I, calorie counting, you know, there's this idea that it doesn't work and stuff. And, you know, what I would say is number one, I think there's an image of what that is versus what it really is. Imagine you're trying to balance a household budget, but you pay no attention to your checking account, what's going in and what's going out. How do you, how do you properly do that? You can't. And this is no different, right? So by paying attention to this, we could learn. Now, it doesn't mean you have to track for the rest of your life. It just means that to learn and to get an idea, because most people have no idea how many calories are in certain foods. They underestimate a lot of stuff. They don't know what's protein rich and what's not. And by tracking, you could learn a lot. And that's what I find helpful. And then from there, if you could take a mindful approach, that's great. Um, but I, I do think there is value in doing that. And the reason why I encourage my clients to do some tracking is because the evidence demonstrates that it works as well as my experience. So that's kind of that in a nutshell. And do you recommend a certain app for tracking? Sure, I prefer MyFitnessPal just because it's the largest, honestly, They're, and they have a premium option so you can get some kind of cool features. There's a huge food database. They're constantly adding features, you know, like scanning barcodes. And, and once you track some food too, something to keep in mind is you build up a local database and you tend to eat similar foods, right? That's pretty normal. So once you've tracked it, it's gonna be right there for you to do. And, and there's little tricks you can do too, right? If you're not sure how much something is, and you measure everything, assuming it's not a, like on, on a labeled package or something, you know, you can use your hands and stuff to estimate and, and just get a pretty good idea of where you stand. What I found from measuring and using my fitness pal, that includes snacks. So that includes anything that you put in your mouth. And what you find is, is typically you, your, your brain thinks of meals as, as counting calories. But sometimes I'll go in the pantry, I'll grab a handful of pretzels or almonds or, or Twizzlers, whatever it is. And once you start counting those, it, it really adds up quickly. And what I found is that the carbs typically, I, I exceed my allotment in the carbs and the fats and protein is always the hardest. So what I did is, is I made sure I started the day off right. After I work out in the morning, I have a protein shake. It's very high in protein, it's about 54 grams. Mm -hmm. And then from there, if I have, let's call it a regular lunch with a salad or lunch with a salad, I like trifecta a lot. Um, that's, a, that's a meal uh, kit, essentially. You just heat it and eat it. And, uh, and then for, for dinner, we'll have, we'll have a homemade dinner. And also eating at home has another benefit. It's so much easier to track. If you're not eating at a chain restaurant, you're eating at a local establishment, it's really hard to actually calculate that the correct way. Now, now I'll say the, the cheat I found for that is I'll find something similar on MyFitnessPal. Make sure, like use common sense. Some of the entries in there are just off and sure. you, you know it. Um, there's definitely fat in donuts. So don't, uh, don't find a donut entry in MyFitnessPal from, from Dunkin' Donuts that has no fat in it. But um, do, you, uh, do you have any other tips for tracking? 
Yeah, I, I think like you said, you know, A, you don't overwhelm yourself. Just try and keep it simple. Like you said, if you eat out, find something similar, um, you know, that might be in there that, that might be accurate. Um, and, and just learn from it. Like you said, you got to track everything. I can't tell you how many times a lot of people, they track stuff, but they, they leave out certain things. Just I, uh, subconsciously, I guess, sometimes. They'll be like, well, what about this? What about that? Oh, yeah, I do, I do snack on that. I do snack on that kind of thing, you know? And a lot of the times what you'll find is just mindless eating, right? It's not done because they're hungry or anything, or it's a habit that's tied to something else, right? So like, oh, at night I sit on the couch and I watch Netflix, and then I just associate that with snacking. It's like, okay, well, let's, let's figure out. Maybe, maybe you still snack, but maybe we change what you snack on, right? So um, you maybe add something nutrient-dense to something palatable that you enjoy, right? So maybe you like M&Ms. Okay, well, limit the amount of M&Ms and maybe have some raw almonds or walnuts or something and, and get full and eat something nutrient dense while you do it, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's like a mirror, it'll, it'll show you. And if you don't wanna see, then hey, don't look. But um, I, I do think it's helpful. And like I said, it, it does drive mindful eating. And, and also the, the pra another kind of mindful practice people could do is, you know, reassessing what it means to be full. You know, full isn't like eating everything until, you know, you can't, you can't move or anything like that, right? That's overeating. You should stop roughly 80% short of that when you're, or 80% full, 20% short of that. Wait a few minutes and see how you feel and often you find that you're, you're okay, you're fine. And as you make that a habit, it becomes easier. So really just pay attention to what you're doing. That'll, that'll make a big difference for sure. So if someone's looking to lose weight, is the number one thing outside from, or maybe in place of one of these fad diets, which I want to talk about next, to really just focus on getting a calorie deficit based diet that you are tracking and then you're looking for like 20 to 30 percent less calories than your uh, than your body needs to then lose the weight correct yeah that's that is all so fad diets for instance you know i do seminars and you know one of my uh favorite slides that i made has um all the fad diets in a circle and they have an arrow pointing to the middle right so it'll say keto vegan whole 30 um, paleo, intermittent fasting, alternate day fasting, right? Those are more um, eating schedules. And in the middle pointed is an energy deficit. If you are losing weight slash body fat, it's because you're in an energy deficit. 100% that's it. There is absolutely zero evidence that people can eat whatever they want insofar as and not be in a deficit and lose weight, right? Because you'll hear somebody say, oh, I go on, um, you know, whatever fad diet and I lose weight and I eat whatever I want. It's like, okay, well, that diet has done a successful job of tricking you into an energy deficit where you are taking less than you burn. Otherwise, you don't lose weight, right? This is thermodynamics. That's how it works. Um, you know, so the, the, that's, that's number one. So make sure you recognize and understand what the underlying cause of your successes in your diet. And then two, ask yourself, do I really see myself doing this in the long term, right? Because that's a big one. You know, you, you mentioned keto, you had done it, you know, and, and I'm not criticizing, you know, if somebody's successful with keto, just to be clear, good. Like, I'm happy for them. I want them to do well. And you could do it healthfully. You know, it's, you could eat a lot of vegetables. You could eat a lot of protein. You could do, it's great, right? But can you sustain it? And is it necessary, right? And, and you know, just using that as an example to, to dive in is, you've been tricked into an energy deficit with keto because you're generally eating a more protein rich diet um, and you're eating palatable, you're eating foods that are not too palatable and not easily overeaten, right? So the key to why people generally succeed on like a low carb or keto diet, let's just call it less than 50 grams of carbohydrates per day, right? Um, is because they're being tricked into an energy deficit by eating a protein rich diet because protein is the most filling macronutrient. You know, when you eat protein rich foods, you, 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 you end up the fullest when we look at a satiety index. That's just how satisfied people are after eating. Protein rich foods are gonna be at the top, right? Imagine trying to overeat chicken versus tortilla chips, right? Y you'll, you'll get full from the chicken before you, you would with, with the tortilla chips in terms of calories. Um, so it's, it's biased toward that. So make sure you understand that. And then, you know, if you're an athlete trying to perform, I would argue it's not optimal. I think there's a lot of evidence to show that if we look at, you know, your favorite professional athlete or, you know, at the Olympics, they're not doing keto, right? N not, not in those sports, no way. So one of the things that I see on keto, because I did try, try keto, and I, I followed a keto book, Drew Manning's, to the T, and I thought his book is really good if you're going to try keto in the sense that the mistakes I see people make in keto, and you're the fitness expert, I am not, but common sense tells me you cannot eat a pound of bacon and then not be in, not be in ketosis because because you're mixing it with alcohol or something else and then call it a keto diet. The other thing that I realized with keto is that 
in order to get in ketosis, your fat intake has to be at such a level to put you there. So if you are eating such fatty foods, but then you're, you're not, you're doing something to kick you out of ketosis, like eating a lean chicken breast even, or having alcohol, or having something too high in carbs, then all of a sudden you're, you just, it's not keto, it's a crappy diet. I can't tell you how many friends and, and people that I know, they're like, they're in keto and I see them, and yeah, they might be following some of a keto diet, but then they're no way getting in ketosis. And for myself, like I, would, I was checking my blood like three or four times a day to make sure I was, I was in keto. And what happened was I lost a bunch of weight. But then I, I wasn't feeling that great. Like, and I know people say, you're, you know, it takes a while and you're going to feel good af after a period of time. But I, just logically, I was like, what I'm eating cannot be good long-term for my heart. It can't be good long-term for my health. Yeah, I might be getting the results, but is, is this sustainable? Sure. So, so a couple of things there. So one, like you mentioned, I think sustainability is the number one thing. What we see is people can start, they do keto, and once they adapt, right, some of them do feel good, right? Oh, I have more mental clarity, all that. Fine. I, I'm not going to deny people that. Um, but what we know from research, it was a fairly recent meta-analysis, after a year, nobody's in keto. In fact, what we see is their carbohydrate intake continually kind of creep up, right? They start under that 50-gram level, and then it starts to come up. And so, so, so that would be number one. Number two, with, with somebody who's a keto advocate, just to steel man their argument, they would say, well, you don't have to do bacon wrapped in cheese. You know, you could do more healthy things. Okay, fair enough. Again, then the sustainability question comes up, right? So that's, that would be right. You said you had chicken breast that went up because the secret, the thing about keto, and it's based on a, a fallacy insofar as energy balance and fat loss, is that when you eat carbohydrates, your insulin levels go up which means that you can't lose body fat. Well, this is a misunderstanding of how insulin works. Yes, in the short term, that is the case because insulin is kind of a, a director. It's a traffic cop in the system and it's, it's a dimmer switch. It's not an on-off thing, right? People think of these things as binary. But what happens is between meals, your insulin levels come down as well as overnight when you're sleeping. And the key factor is your total calorie intake relative to what you burn. So th that's an oversimplification. It's a misunderstanding of insulin. The body wouldn't make insulin if it was this you know, all evil thing that it's kind of presented as, right? It's, it's just a misunderstanding of really how it works. And as you mentioned, a chicken breast kicks you out of ketosis. That's because protein elevates insulin too. And you have to have protein. And if your goal is to have lean mass, we need protein coming into the system, you know? That's, it's irreplaceable. Um, and we need an optimal amount. So th those, are, those are two factors that I wanna show. And then you'll say, well, why, why do people succeed in, with keto in the short term? Well, like I mentioned, number one, it's a little biased to being more protein rich. Number two, when you go into the grocery store and you go just, just from looking at labels, you're going to look at a bunch of things and at least a third of your foods at the store, you can't buy them because you're going to, so there's less food reward, there's less variety. So number one, that's a factor. Um, and then the question is, is it necessary, right? Well, it's unnecessary. And there's a lot of deification of certain food, like, oh, avocados are better than bananas. I see these YouTubers saying this. It's like, that's absurd. You know, and you, you can't even make that classification because they're two different foods. Uh, you know, one is great for potassium. You know, the other one's a good source of fat. You know, they're just, they're just different. And this, there's this idea, this one's on a pedestal, this one's here. And it's no, it's the dose that, that matters, number one, um, and also how satisfied are you. Um, so, so those are a few factors to consider. And when we look at, let's just say, like a typical low-carb diet, and we have one group doing a low-carb diet, right, and they're going to get an ample amount of protein. And then we have another group, and they get a high-carb diet, low-protein, low-fat. They're, they're doomed to fail, right? In the research, they're doomed to fail because they don't have enough protein coming in the system. But when we have a third group, and we say, hey, let's match the protein with the low-carb group, and then they can distribute the rest of their calories evenly between carbs and fat, they end up in the same place. And that third group, by the way, has more flexibility. They can eat low-carb one day, high-carb the next, as long as their you know, total calories are on point and they're staying protein-rich. So by adding in more flexibility, you find that people, A, they're able to adhere to it longer, and then B, if you're trying to perform, you will perform better. So when we talk about athletic performance, you know, I, I mentioned that before, Keto is not optimal. It's not true. I, I don't, it, there's no evidence for it. If somebody wants to point me to it, I'm happy to read it. I always keep an open mind with science because, you know, scientific conclusions are inductive. We leave open the possibility, possibility they will later be proven wrong. And, and, and just lastly, if your palate is such that you prefer more of a low-carb approach, that's great. But the idea that you have to be in ketosis all the time and stuff, and there's, and there's a metabolic advantage to it, it's, it's just not true. Got it. What about intermittent fasting? Is that in the same level? Because to me, that's not a fad-ish diet, but that is, that those are 
it's it's a buzzword. Like people are do, are doing fasting, and and a few years back, I was doing fasting mainly because I just wasn't hungry in the morning. So I would do like the sixteen eight fasting. It was pretty loose, but you know I I followed it. I thought it was very natural for for me. But then what I realized is when I got in the feeding window, there's no way I would eat enough protein to not lose muscle mass. So do you, you find that pretty common? Sure, so a couple, a couple things there. So one, is as far as the protein intake in a short window, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, you'll have a protein drink with like 50, gra four grams of protein. And some people are probably thinking, well, that's too much in one sitting. Your body can only use X amount per hour, right? And, and that X amount ceiling, by the way, would vary based upon somebody's body size. That, that's gonna make a difference, right? Like a 120 pound person, a 200 pound person have a different ceiling on how much protein they could absorb per hour. But also, just because you can only absorb X amount of protein within a given hour, let's just say, doesn't mean that the rest gets wasted. It's just that it'll stay in your system longer. Your gastric emptying rate will be slower, so your body has more time to process it, right? We know this, right? The larger the meal you eat, oh, I'm, I'm full for longer, right? That's because your body's taking longer to digest it. Um, but going back to the you know intermittent fasting is it's just an eating schedule, right? What I like to tell people to simplify this is I say what you eat and how much you eat are far more important than when you eat it. Now you will get advocates of um, intermittent fasting claiming all these benefits of autophagy, uh, mental clarity, things like that. Um, the latter of which, if, if you feel that from it, then by all means do it. I, I never tell people not to do it. If that eating schedule helps you adhere to your goals better, I am all for it but there is nothing inherently beneficial to that schedule, aside from the fact that maybe it helps you adhere to your goals, right? A lot of the things attributed to it where people will say, oh, my blood work was better, this and that. Yeah, that's because you were an energy deficit. Because how do I know this? Well, we've researched it. We've put, excuse me, people where we match the food intake and we do different schedules. One group is eating, you know, just a typical linear, in a linear fashion, you know, three meals, couple snacks, what have you. Um, one group's doing intermittent fasting, and then we can even add in an alternate day fasting group. For, for 24 hours, one group eats all their calories and then doesn't eat the next day. And when we match the food, same, end up in the same place. So there's a lot of things, though, that you'll hear, like said, anecdotally, like clarity and things like that. And that's fine. I don't dismiss people. And if it helps you adhere and that fits your daily life schedule, fine. You know, um, not eating for an entire day does not sound fun to me personally. Um, so, or the four-hour feeding window, that, that doesn't sound fun fun to me either. Yeah, there's just, so it, it's just, but if it does to you and you enjoy it and, and it helps you adhere, then I am all for it. But just know that what's causal behind it, right? The underlying cause, if you're succeeding, is an energy deficit. It is not the eating schedule, despite what your favorite YouTuber tells you and ask them to point you to the evidence of well-designed studies. And you could email me and I'll send you the opposite. <laughs> so we're talking about how to get ripped in your 40s. And one of the misconceptions also is about alcohol consumption. And that's become very taboo in, in for some people recently because they're realizing the effect of alcohol on them for various reasons. And for myself personally, I know that I, I got the maximal results when I reduced my alcohol consumption significantly. Like I went from maybe having two to three drinks, four, to five times a week. I hate to admit that, but that's what it was. I would look forward to that after a hard day of, of work. Like I would say, I'm gonna enjoy a glass of wine with my wife, and then that would turn into a half bottle or a bottle sometimes, or a beer after work at dinner, especially if, if we would go out. And then when I reduce my alcohol intake to maybe a couple weekends a month, or maybe one weekend a month, or in some cases I went 75 days plus without even drinking at all, I know it's the significant difference, but I know you, you talk about that. It, it doesn't have, like you still can get ripped. You still can, can get lean with alcohol. So can you unwrap that a bit? Sure, sure. So it's, it's the dose that makes the poison, right? As it goes. So how much you're drinking really does matter. Um, you know, if, if I'm getting specific, I tell clients try and keep it under 20% of your total calorie intake for ideally one day a week. But if it's two, okay, I think we can get around that, right? And I've had some clients do more than that and succeed and, you know, I don't recommend that because like you said, one of the biggest things you notice when you don't drink is just how good you feel in the morning, right? You, you, there's not that damper on your system. And we have a very casual relationship with alcohol because of how ubiquitous it is in our um, society. And we forget the fact that as, as far as the American Cancer Society is concerned, it's the same level carcinogen as cigarettes, right? We just don't think of that, right? We don't think of it in that context. And, and again, I'm not trying to scare anybody because it's dose dependent, right? 
Um, so it's not that you can't drink, and, and I don't want anyone to sit here and be like, well, I'm not giving up my whatever, I can't succeed. You can. Just as you do it, the big thing I try and get my clients to ask themselves is, you know, do I need that random beer, you know, like you mentioned on a Tuesday or Wednesday night? And if you start just kind of asking that question, you start to find that, you know, I don't. You go to bed and you wake, well, I feel better. You know, you don't have that kind of like wet blanket on your system, right? And then maybe, you know, at dinner on a Saturday night, you want to have a glass of wine or something. And, and that's okay. And I would say that's a good, healthy relationship with alcohol. And, you know, just one last thing on alcohol, too, to cover is, you know, we have this idea because of the, in the lay press, what we'll hear is, you know, social drinking is, is healthy, right? It's, it's good to have a glass of wine a day or, you know, that kind of thing. Almost like it's better than being a non drinker. It's debatable now, though. They took that recommendation down in half recently, too. And here's why. What you would have is in alcohol research, we'd have three groups. We'd have heavy drinkers, which we all agree and could see clearly they are the, the least healthy, right? They have a bunch of um, health issues happening. Then we have the social drinkers, and then we have the non-drinkers. And the social drinkers in some categories would outperform the non-drinkers. The issue was in the non-drinker category were what we call sick quitters, former heavy drinkers who drank themselves sick, and now they're getting classified with non-drinkers and they're bringing the non-drinkers down. And when we adjust those people out of the non-drinking category, what we find is that the non-drinkers are the healthiest, right? In terms of you know, just long-term uh, you know, middle-aged mortality, kind of um, you know, chronic diseases, things like that. So yeah, generally speaking, all other things being equal, you're better off without it. But again, life's not black and white, right? So there's gonna be a little bit of a continuum. And if you like, really enjoy wine or something like that, and you like to have a little bit of it on a Saturday or something, th that's not gonna be a limiting factor for you being able to achieve your goals. You know, that's a big part of it. A uh, piece of advice that, that I'll give is if you are used to drinking, I don't care if it's a few times a week, if it's once a week, twice a week, and you can stop, I would try to stop while you at least get started on a new program or I don't want to call this a diet, it's a lifestyle for sure. me. But what I found is that first day is the hardest and the first week's the hardest and the first day is the hardest because as soon as you tell yourself you can't have something, that's when you want it the most. Sure. So it's all mental. So what, what I did is I pushed through that day, then the first week became easier, the second week became easier. By week three, I had a craving for a beer. And, and I would recommend Athletic Brewing as a good non-alcoholic IPA, if you're an IPA drinker, get, get one of those beers. You'll, you'll just wanna have one, versus like if you have an alcoholic IPA, you'll wanna have two or three of those. And I think the one is like 70 calories. Sure. So, and it's a lot of carbs, I'm sure, but it's much better than having alcohol, especially because there's no hangover. Yeah. So I would recommend that. There's hop tea as well, that's non-alcoholic non if, if you like that taste. Unfortunately, I haven't found a good alternative for red wine, but uh, that's fine. So what happened with me is, is again, like the, at week three I had a craving, but at week six, I was jogging through my neighborhood and I passed this pub called Jackson Avenue Pub, the best burgers, the best tap beer. Like I just love going in there. But you're going in there and there's no way I'm leaving there without having like 2,500 calories. Sure. I'm having a few beers, burger and Cajun fries. So I, at, day, at day 60 of abstaining from alcohol, I, I run past there and I'd even crave it. It was the first time I've ever went past there that I didn't crave it. And it's amazing that your cravings go away and I started to appreciate things like blueberries and apples and fruits, they started to taste so different to me. Yeah. Do you find that with other clients? Yeah, that's great. And it's a great recommendation. I do find that going cold turkey and kind of realizing what it's like to feel good, this is a big um, thing I stress with clients is, you know, I work with a lot of people and sometimes a lot of people have forgotten what it's like to feel good. And when I say feel good, I don't mean in a yes, no sense. I mean like a scale of one to 10. Let's call a one, you wake up hungover, you got a flu. A 10 is you're on cloud nine, you feel great, whatever. Well, a lot of people, they're just their normal to three or four, right? And that sucks. And they forgot what it's like to wake up at an eight, nine, 10, right? You know, to the point where if they've got the neighbor that's like that, they're like, I hate that guy. You know, it's just, and it, in a joking way, right? But um, what ends up happening is they start to realize what, how good it feels to feel good, as silly as that sounds. And we're all human. And positive reinforcement will drive you to want to repeat the behaviors that got you there. So pay attention to how you feel when you wake up in the morning. And that's what you'll find from the not drinking and stuff. And then on, on your second point, as far as palates changing, yes, that's a big factor. And as, and I always like to say this to people, you, you crave what you eat. So if you constantly eat, and I'm not picking on McDonald's or Burger King or anything, but if that's what you eat all the time, well, your gut microbiome, the bacteria that live in your gut, they're gonna be adapted to digesting those foods. And what we do know is there's something called the gut-brain axis that will drive your cravings. Um, it'll affect your immune system. 
It will affect your energy levels, your mood. Now, the degree to which we're still learning, this is difficult research to do, so I don't want to exaggerate it, you know, just to be clear, but we do know that there is an effect there. And I see it all the time, you know, just observationally from uh, coaching clients, is like you said, all of a sudden you're craving fruit, you're craving vegetables. Well, that's because as you eat that way, your gut microbiome is changing and the bacteria that digest those foods are moving in and they're driving your craving subconsciously. And then you are making a connection consciously where you're like, wow, I feel good after I eat this, right? So I always tell people, pay attention how you feel. Even if you eat something, say, greasy and bad, and you're like, ugh, well, that's going to make you make a better decision in the future. So there's that, those two factors. One, there's the mindful part. Number two, there's that subconscious level, and that has to do with your gut microbiome changing. And, and just to touch on that just quickly is that doesn't mean go out and buy a probiotic. It's not going to help you if you have a healthy uh, gut. Those are, if we look at research, they really only benefit people who have something like irritable bowel syndrome or one of the irritable bowel diseases, Crohn's, colitis, because their GI tract is constantly being cleaved, which means niches are constantly available. If you have a healthy gut, there's, there's no rooms for rent in there. That, that supplement isn't necessarily going to help. Um, you know, uh, so the foods that you eat will make positive changes uh, from that standpoint. So that's the best way to change your gut microbiome. So you, you mentioned uh, a supplement, and mm -hmm. you were kind of against taking that specific supplement. But when you are embarking on a new lifestyle change or, or diet in this case, um, what supplements do you recommend? Sure, sure. So this again is, is gonna be individual because um, some people you know, will benefit from other things, but I generally am a minimalist when it comes to supplements, at least starting. And, and uh, so first and foremost, a, a protein powder I generally find helps most people. And I think of that as food, honestly. And I always encourage people to make smoothies out of it where you can put fruit or vegetables or walnuts and things like that into a smoothie. Make them really taste good and refreshing, right? You never feel bad after you drink a smoothie, right? For the most part. Um, so protein powder is really helpful. Um, number two is going to be, for most people, vitamin D, right? Especially if you live in a, a climate where you don't get a lot of sun, right? Now, if you're living in Florida and you're in the sun a fair amount, then you know, you're probably okay. But you can get this tested with blood work. You know, the next time you go, it's usually now included on a standard panel that you can ask and just check your vitamin D levels. And just a quick factoid on that is, you know, I just read a, a study recently where there's a big push now. If, uh, there's always this fallacy with nutrients where if some is good, more must be better, right? Like, hey, some water's good. Why, if one weight gallon's good, why not drink five? Well, you'll hype, end up with hyponatremia, right? Because you'll water down your electrolytes. But um, th that is a fallacy because with vitamin D, let's just say if, I'm, uh, if you start taking too much of it, what this study showed is that it actually hurts calcium absorption, right? One of the limiting factors that we found in the past was, you know, we would tell, you know, women as they age to, hey, take calcium, 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 calcium. But they could take it until the cows come home. But if you didn't have enough vitamin D in your system, you wouldn't absorb it efficiently. So taking vitamin D was helpful from that standpoint. But now if you take too much vitamin D, there's actually a down regulatory effect. So you don't absorb calcium as well. So the bottom line is there's like a sweet spot with nutrients that you want to get into. You know, like uh, if you take vitamin C, for instance, the greatest benefit you get from vitamin C is the initial dose because you don't have scurvy, right? There's nothing that vitamin C can do more from than, do than prevent scurvy. And then you kind of get into this range where it kind of dips down and you're in this kind of optimal zone. But then you don't want to just take a bunch of it, right? Because you can end up with a stomach ache and stuff. And yeah, vitamin C is water soluble, so it's going to be difficult to kind of go over on that. But the larger point here is just because some is good doesn't mean more is better. So vitamin D, um, for if you don't eat um, omega-3 rich fish on a regular basis, say like a pound of salmon a week, I think a fish oil can be really helpful. And for those of you... Um, who are in an energy deficit, a multivitamin doesn't hurt as an insurance policy. Now, if you're in energy balance and your diet is nutrient dense, you probably don't need one. And if you're buying one that's, let's say, telling you to take three a day, you could probably take one and just be fine with that just to kind of cover up any bases, assuming your diet is largely nutrient dense. And then for those seeking performance enhancement, I would say creatine monohydrate is the best performance enhancer that there is. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of overlooked because it's been out a while and companies don't make a lot of money on the monohydrate form. You know, they have their fancy form, which costs a lot more, but all the evidence is basically pointing to creatine monohydrate. So that's helpful. And then lastly, something like beta alanine is another performance enhancing supplement. So those last two are kind of more, hey, performance enhancing. And um, I, I know you enjoy your caffeine and I would say caffeine is overlooked too. So uh, caffeine is a great performance enhancer too. Where can people get beta alanine? Yeah, so there's, you can buy it online, I'm sure, like Amazon, places like that. Um, I mean, is that mixed in something? I, yeah, I don't so, take that. Yeah, so it's, it's sometimes it's in pre-workout supplements, and what causes like the tingly effect. Oh, sometimes people get the paresthesia. 
Um, you know, what it's doing is it's delay, it has a buffering effect. So it's delaying the effect of the acid that dissociates from lactic acid, that burn that you feel in your muscles. Well, beta alanine actually buffers that effect. So um, it's, it's actually got some pretty interesting research on it. The kind of minimum you want is about three grams per day is kind of like the efficacious dose. So if you do buy it, just make sure if it's in a supplement that you buy, that you know how much of you're getting as opposed to like a proprietary blend because you want to make sure you get the full amount. But you can buy it by itself or in mixed into some kind of these energy drinks and stuff. What about collagen? Coll yes, you co <laughs> collagen, that's one that I recently added. I can't believe I skipped that. So um, collagen was one that I was skeptical on for a while, right? And now the Was it Jennifer Aniston? She made yeah, it. that was it, I got sold. <laughs> um, so no, she's good. She's good, right? And she is right. It does help with hair, skin, and nails. So there is definitely a beauty aspect to it. There's interesting research showing that people who take collagen, you know, their, their nose, their nails. I'm, I'm saying that because she's a spokesperson for what Vital Proteins. I think Vital Collagens, Proteins. Yeah, right, right. and they're like in Costco now, yeah. I think, right? So yeah, and there's different brands, you know, um, out there. But yeah, um, collagen peptides are definitely beneficial. Um, the, the, aside from the beauty side of it, it's actually really good for joint uh, health, right? Ligaments, tendons, things like that. And the research at this point, it's, it's pretty overwhelming demonstrating the benefits of it by uh, introducing it into your system. So five to 10 grams a day, right into like a smoothie. You know, um, people even put like, it mixes super easy. It's like the easiest mixing protein, right? Cause it's broken down into peptides, it's hydrolyzed. You could even mix like a chocolate one into coffee and stuff like that. So I would definitely recommend collagen, especially, you know, this, the theme being get ripped in your forties. You want those joints feeling good. So I think it's a very easy fix and it's a pretty cheap supplement too. So definitely. So to recap those protein collagen, Fish oil, a multivitamin, if you're in a calorie deficit, is optional. Beta alanine to get that pre workout buzz going on. Caffeine, so something, coffee, tea, like the caffeine from, sure. from those drinks is fine. And then um, creatine. And then creatine, yeah. And, and vitamin D, we mentioned. And then, and then vitamin D. So creatine is something I take on a daily basis. Um, before I work out, I'll take an amino acid pre workout drink put some creatine in there, work out. As soon as I'm done working out, I take, uh, or I, I make a smoothie with fruit, spinach, almond milk, berries, it's delicious, a banana. Lots and, of ice, right, make sure it's cold. <laughs> yeah, lots of ice and, uh, and I have that and that's kind of my breakfast. And then I'll have like mid-morning snacks sometimes. Then I'll have lunch and dinner and I snack on things, but I track my calories in my fitness pal most of the time, my day is so, routine now that that I don't track as much as I sure. did because I know where I'm at sure but that was a reward for doing it for you know 60 days or so absolutely um so outside of that before we get into the action steps and I want to level set we're talking a lot about diet here because I believe personally that you got to get your diet right first what I found is that no matter how many times a day I worked out and no matter how many calories I burned, the days that I cheated on my diet negated completely what I did. So I could never outwork a, a bad diet. And that's really important because I don't think for me personally, and this, this stat varies for everyone, but for me personally, it's like 99% of how I feel and how lean I am or if I am getting that, that cut look. Um, is, is diet, and that's why we're talking about that today. So I'd love to have you back again to talk about programs when it comes to, sure. to different types of trainings. But let's, let's touch on that now for, for the next couple of minutes. If you are listening to this and you're not doing anything, or let's just say I know a lot of people that just run, or they'll just do something cardio-wise, what would you recommend changing or doing for someone looking to they're gonna to listen to this, they're gonna start following this diet. What would you recommend from a fitness perspective in terms of uh, like a, a workout program? Sure, great question. So if you only have time and say time is the limiting factor, right? And we can all make time, right? You know, I know you touched on that, your last podcast, you'd mentioned, um, you know, you had some tips up from that. So I, of course you share that, but um, if you can only do one thing, I would say resistance training is gonna be the number one thing. If you can only do one thing because of the health benefits, right? Because number one, your bone density is gonna improve, your body composition, so you will build muscle, which is gonna help with your you know, resting metabolic rate. Um, 
So, so from those, you know, the insulin sensitivity, all, all of these benefits that come with resistance training, and we can ta attach your aerobic base within the context of resistance training. You know, maybe you, you know, you do your push pulls back to back, right? And you kind of get your heart rate up that way and kind of tax your aerobic system. So I would say if you can only do one resistance training, and then from there, I, there's like dimmer switches, right? So over here we have like the strength training, so kind of the explosive strong muscle. Um, number two is gonna be like your anaerobic endurance, right? So maybe some of your high intensity cardio. And then number three is gonna be more your, your aerobic fitness, right? Your, your low intensity steady state cardio. And I, it's not an on off switch again, these are dimmers. And if you can get all dimmers at the same level, you know, that would be like a, a decathlete, right? Like a full athlete across the board. Like right now, like we're in a jujitsu gym, right? So Brazilian jujitsu, mixed martial arts, you know, I think people are really in, into these sports because you get to see athletes of all backgrounds come in and you get to see like, hey, they gotta be strong, they gotta be fast, and oh, by the way, they better have endurance too, right? So it's kind of a decathlete, so to, so to speak, in that sense. So if your goal is overall fitness, I think kind of tapping all three of those dimmers is ideal. Now just note that the higher the intensity that your, your workouts are, the greater the risk of injury. So there's going to be a, an amount of volume that you wanna cap there where you don't wanna get hurt. Whereas when you go to more of the endurance, low intensity, steady state, you have a much higher capacity that you could do without risk of injury. And, and within the context too of the high intensity, there are activities that you could do, right, that are less risky in terms of injury, right? Like instead of running a bunch of sprints constantly, where inevitably, you know, you might pull a hamstring. I mean, we see it with world-class athletes, right? You see the world's fastest man and one guy always pulls up with a hamstring. Um, well, maybe get on like an assault bike or, or get on a rower or something like that because it's safer, right? You're connected to the machine. You're, you're less likely to get hurt, that kind of thing. Um, so. So that would be kind of it in a nutshell. And then the last thing I would just say is, no matter what you're doing, your body adapts to what you do. So you mentioned like a runner. If your goal is to run as fast as you can for 26 miles and that's all you wanna do, right? Well, you're gonna look like somebody that can run 26 miles as fast as you can. So you're gonna be very small, um, you'll be lean, but you're not gonna have a lot of muscle per se, right? And, and, and the question is, is that the healthiest? I, I would say that introducing some strength training would be ideal. And now we even see that with elite marathoners where they recognize the benefits of that too, right? Um, but if you're looking to be more, a little more in between, well then, you know, then you wanna lift some weights and stuff too and kinda make time for that. And then the diet is the other variable that would come in now. How are you feeding the machine, right? So whatever the movements you're doing, right? And you could just go across like track athletes, look at the 100 meter guys versus say the, the 5K guys and you know, or gals and, or then the decathlete, right? That kind of thing. And you're gonna see different body types based upon that. That's great. So one of the, um, one of the things that happen when you are, when you do start a journey like this, because of your caloric deficits, especially when you're working out, you're gonna feel like you're hungry and that's gonna lead you to, to some maybe emotional decisions. What do you tell yourself when you feel like you're starving, but you know you shouldn't really be eating or you, or you shouldn't be eating um, the bad thing that sure. is not on your diet? Sure, yeah, so a big thing is um, tell yourself that means I'm burning body fat is a big part to it, number one. And you know, if I'm working with somebody, we're gonna make sure that you're, you're not gonna have any nutrient deficiencies. We're just, you know, just from a macro standpoint, you're taking in like 25, 30% less than you burn. And if you say, I don't have the energy, I'm gonna tell you, you're wearing it. That body fat that you wanna get rid of, you're gonna force your body to put it in your bloodstream to use for energy. So you can overcome that and a good mental trick is you know, maybe you drink some water, you chew some gum or that kind of thing, but you also tell yourself that means I'm burning body fat and that is the goal. Because physiologically there's a part of our brain called the lipostat that is going to drive you to wanna to eat because your body's goal is to maintain body mass because we, uh, our ancestors didn't live in a time when cal calories were readily available, right? So we had to have this drive to eat to, to, to maintain, and you could be 400 pounds and you start losing weight. That part of your brain, you have what's called a biological set point, thinks you should be roughly that weight. So it's gonna fight you a little bit from that standpoint. The good news is that as you come down, maybe you hit a plateau, but maybe you're just changing your biological set point, right? And that's where we get into the differences between weight loss and weight loss maintenance, right? Keeping it off. And that's where there's a whole other process of building up your calories slowly, keeping you there. And for most people, if you could stay at your new body weight slash body comp for about six months, I'm pretty confident you're gonna be able to stay there mindfully. Um, now, if you're really heavy and coming down, you know, that process can take longer. 
Um, and that's why we see things like The Biggest Loser when they lose weight like really fast and then they all come back because the whole reverse dieting process, was, they, you know, they, once the show was over, that was it, you know, that kind of thing. Without, there's research on that too with actual contestants and stuff, but I don't want to open up that whole can of worms because I know we're, we're time limited, but th that's another part to keep in mind for sure. Yeah, for myself, I would do exactly what you said. I would, I would those cravings I would turn into feelings to say, I'm burning fat right now. Like this is what it feels like to burn fat. And that would really help. The other thing I would say, because my cravings came at night always, but the morning I would feel so good when I followed a diet the night before. So it's remember tomorrow, which uh, I talk a lot about in my podcast. Jesse Itzler talks about that as well. So when you think about cheating, especially like for myself during the evening, whether that's grabbing you know, an ice cream or grabbing that leftover piece of pizza, of, uh, piece of pizza Whatever it is, I say, remember tomorrow, because I know I'm going to step on that scale, I'm going to be lighter than I was today, or I'm going to start to feel different. I'm not going to feel bloated. And that really helps me as well, because I see that in the numbers, and I see that in how I feel. And something else you could do too in those cases, if you're just overwhelmed, try something protein rich first. Like I'll tell people, look, if you feel like you're just gonna raid the cabinet, do me a favor, have something protein rich first, right? Grab the I cottage cheese yeah. or some kind of yogurt or make a protein shake and then just kind of decide. And often what you'll find is you're okay. It's not that there's not calories in the protein, there are, but protein's gonna be more filling, stay in your system longer. And you lose roughly 25% of the calories from your body trying to break it down. That's that thermic effect of food. So that would be something that if you just feel overwhelmed, that's a good thing. And if you do say mess up, Give yourself some grace. Don't don't say this is over. That's it. No, no, no. It's one day. You got tomorrow. Yeah. You're good, or you know that kind of thing. You, you could you could definitely um, do that. So you know, as the the, the quote goes, right? We, we've talked about this. Is uh, um, easy choices, hard life. Hard choices, easy life. Right? I, I believe that's Jersey Gregoric. I may be mispronouncing his name, but it's a great quote, and I think it's true. And if you kind of start thinking like that, you'll get there. And there's light at the end of the tunnel because once you get to your goal, you don't need a deficit anymore. You get yeah. to eat an energy balance, right? This is not a life sentence, right? Um, so that's cool. And if you do have you know, body fat you wanna lose and say you're overweight, you've got an opportunity. I, I don't get to get a cool before after, right? <laughs> that, that, I don't have that opportunity, you do. I think that's a great opportunity. So think of it that way, right? And, and as far as with like time and exercise, I know these are things we talked about is, you know, if you have kids, you owe it to your kids. You're not being selfish by taking the time out to go and do that exercise or to eat better. You're actually being selfless because in the long term, you, you want to be there for your kids. You want to be healthy. You don't want them to have to take care of you when you're older because you took care of yourself, right? And you know, we can run into a lot of people who work their butts off their whole life and they finally have the financial freedom to do what they want to do but they compromise their health and now they can't do the things they want to do. And I guarantee you, if you ask them if you can go back, they'd go back and choose your health. And, and the reality is, and companies know this, if you're healthy, you're gonna be a better and more productive employee anyway. So just take that little bit of time to take care of yourself. Yeah, I, I can't agree with that more because that's exactly how I was. I put everything first, put myself last, and then I was 40 pounds overweight, probably 50 pounds overweight. I was developing eczema, I had anxiety. I just had all these ailments and then once I got to a point where I could pro start prioritizing my time, I did. And then I realized that I, I can always prioritize my time. Like I, I run a company now of 740 employees. I, I have a podcast and I still work out three times a day. And I know that sounds crazy, but I work out in the morning. I make, work out at 5.30. At lunchtime, I do jujitsu typically with you. And then at dinner or after dinner in the evening, I'll go for a, a run or walk. And I'll do that four to five times a week. That, that even if you can't do that, work out once. Like sure. there's no way that you cannot prioritize working out once a day. It's because it's not in your routine yet and it's not as important to you as it should be. So I highly recommend that you somehow figure out how to work out. And that could be, typically I find it works when you could do it early because then you're, you're playing offense with your life and you're not letting your day control you. Yeah, you start off with a win. And, and the other benefit too is in the short term, your kids, your, your, your significant others or friends around you, you, you know, I, I'm a big believer you owe it to them to be happy, right? Because life's gonna kick you in the pants sometimes. And you know, you, how you handle it matters. 
And for me, a big part of catharsis for me is that I do work out and I'm active. And I get all that stress out, right? When we leave here after jujitsu, somebody cuts you off in traffic. You're not like, oh, I'm gonna get this guy. It's like, that guy doesn't know me from Adam. And by the way, somebody was just trying to strangle me for the last hour. <laughs> I feel good, like, I'm not gonna, what would I do that for, you know? And, and I think that you get that anxiety out of your system where you're not gripping the wheel, because you, you, we need that. I think it's really important for mental health. You know, I think that does help a lot. So you, you know, the people around you get the best version of you too, which I think is, um, you know, a, a really important detail to it. And, and just like, you know, with, with eating, you know, exercise, think about how you're gonna feel after, right? And, and don't rely on willpower. It's short term, it's fleeting. Maybe within your workout, within a set, you got some willpower and you push through, but the actual workout and the eating good, it's you enjoying it is why you do it. Not because you have willpower, it's because you like it. And because you know, you've kind of revealed the secret is that, yeah, it's, it feels good and you're focused on the long term. And that's, that's where the happiness comes from in the short term, ironically enough. You know? And if you're, if you're watching this, you're probably in a job where you at least know someone in a job that's virtual, that you're behind a computer and all of a sudden your, your body composition starts changing and what you're doing on a daily basis is so different. So like as an example, I used to go to the office on a daily basis. I would get up and walk around. I would talk to people. I would stand up. Now I'm behind Zoom meetings. I have to take my lunchtime to go work out, to go do jujitsu, to go do whatever, because I cannot sit behind a computer stagnant for eight hours a day. I just cannot do it. It is not good, good for my mind. And then I supplement that with walking meetings. I'll either walk on my treadmill and take a Zoom meeting, or I take a meeting over the phone the old fashioned way and not through a video. And that's perfectly fine. And I don't know why that became so taboo. It's like overnight, we just went to video meetings. Yeah. And I think that's gonna affect our health significantly. Your body adapts to what you do. So if you sit at a desk all day like this, your neck, shoulder, problem, I mean, all this, you're gonna look like that's what you do. And you know, you'll hear this adage that sitting is the new smoking. And you know, maybe that's a little bit of hyperbole, but I would say that it's true in the sense that if you could erase smoking a pack of cigarettes by doing some movement, then you know, that would be the case, right? So start simple, start with a little steps goal. You know, that kind of thing. And then maybe some of you are watching and saying, I can't imagine working out or so-and-so is the workout person or whatever. It's like, don't define yourself that way. Number one, we're all made to move. And if you do it, you're gonna feel better. And as much as you can maybe not imagine doing all of it and being happy, I, you just mentioned, you can't imagine not doing it, right? Because you, you get so happy from it. You get that short-term buzz. And, and again, it's just a short-term investment in the long-term future, so. And momentum's a huge thing. Yes. So I will say the hardest part is starting but once you get your streaks going, it is so much easier. It's akin to like starting your car in the outside in the Chicago winters. Mm -hmm. It's that first time that it's like left outside, it's really hard to start. But once it goes and all of a sudden the heat turns on and 15 minutes into the ride, nowadays it's much quicker. Yeah. But all of a sudden your car is nice and warm and you're comfortable. That is what this is like. I'm telling you, you need to start somewhere and that's small. I'm not even, you know, I, I use myself as a crazy example of working out three times a day, but it started with one step. It started with running a mile. It started with, with doing a basic uh, weightlifting program with just two dumbbells. And then it grew from there. So, so I'm telling you, you'll, you'll be shocked and you won't go backwards and don't do it for yourself. Do it for your family, do it for your kids. Like I, I look at myself, I had no other choice because I was gonna die of a heart attack. Sure. There's no way that I would still be alive today. Like I am convinced of that. If I, was, if I kept going on the path that I was, and then what? What was, what was anything I did good for? Yeah. Nothing, I wouldn't be around. Yeah, and surround yourself with people that are driving, right? We hear all these quotes when we're young and then you, know, then you get older and they come true and you're like, you know, so if you wanna soar with the eagles, you can't hang with the crows, it's true. If somebody says, oh, you gotta work out, it's okay, you can just, let's do this and that, it's like, no, 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 no. You wanna be around people who encourage you, who uplift you and stuff, or you can be that person. So I'm not telling you get rid of your friends, but why don't you uplift your friends and be like, hey, you know, or whatever it is, right? Or if it's your spouse, be like, hey, let's, let's do this. We gotta do this together. Make each other accountable, set a goal, you know, husband and wife, hey, we're gonna do this. I see it all the time. You know, when I work with people, I say, is your spouse on board? Because that matters. Social support oh, matters. It matters so much. I cannot underestimate. Because if, you know, if you're doing something and somebody's knocking it, or maybe they don't even mean it in a bad way, they're just teasing. But man, you, know, you can really make a difference from that standpoint. So that matters. And you know, just a quick thing too, if you get tired when you're doing stuff, everyone gets tired. In fact, 
you could be in great shape, you can go for a run. Your first five minutes of running or whatever, let's just say you're running or riding a bike or something, everybody gets tired, there's an actual physiological thing, you have an oxygen deficit, everybody does, but just like you mentioned, the warming up the car made me think of it. Once you get past that five, 10 minutes, you get, your, your heart catches up, it gets enough oxygen in the blood because you went from doing nothing to something. So that like initial tiredness, you could be an elite marathoner, everybody gets that because that's something I hear from me, I got so tired five minutes, I think I do it, they keep going. That's just the oxygen deficit. There's an actual like physiological things happening that you'll you'll be able to catch up to. So, so I I know I could talk to you all day, and, and we've we've went longer than allotted on this uh, on this great topic. But I thought it was very valuable to put a bow on on everything. This is again about how to get ripped in your 40s. What are a few things you'd summarize to get someone there who's watching this that's either just starting or trying to level up? Sure. So, um, so number one, keep an open mind. So, you know, don't box yourself into like a fad. Um, two, download my fitness pal. Start tracking your food intake because even if you're going to hire somebody to work with, having that data will help. You know, like when I work with people, what I don't do is a meal plan because you'll do it for a couple weeks, but eventually you're going to eat how you eat. Let's see what you're doing because there's probably a lot of things you're doing that are totally fine and let's adapt it from there and make changes based on that. So start tracking. Um, you can um, commit to some kind of a, a movement goal, like, hey, I'm gonna work out at least X number of hours per week, you know, that kind of thing. So I would definitely start there. And then you can get more granular from there, right? You could start to say, all right, I'm gonna have at least two servings of vegetables every day and a serving of fruit or, you know, or a smoothie, right? I'm gonna make a smoothie every day, every morning, and, and for a couple weeks, and then let's see how I feel. And often what you see is, well, it starts to impact your other meals because it's like, oh, I started off the day well. Why not, why not keep the momentum going? That kind of thing. So I would definitely you know, start with things like that there. There's tons of resources out there. Now, I know my industry, there's a lot of, there's a lot of myths and a lot of nonsense that it, it bugs me because it, it's, it sets unrealistic expectations for people insofar as sticking to something that's too rigid and unnecessary, right, those two so try and keep it simple from that standpoint. Set simple goals and a little bit at a time. Like I said, something as simple as start tracking and maybe you're, maybe you're somebody who drinks three cans of soda per day. Try, try eliminating it. See, see what happens when you eliminate the calories from that. Try adding like steps. So one to two things a week, habits to work on, and then build off of that. I think that would be a good, good place to go. So and the then KISS just, method. Yeah, yeah, keep it simple, right? Yeah. Just start there. And then if you decide you want to progress and you want to work with like a coach or something like that, there's tons of options out there and you could start to build off of that and then really hone in. And you know, you're going to eat the rest of your life, so why not learn how, so to speak? So speaking of that, how can people learn more and get a hold of you if they sure. want to? So um, I have a website, it's nutrition361.com. Um, 360 was taken and the person that wanted to tell me wanted way too much money. So I, I went a degree beyond and uh, saved myself about 10 grand. So, <laughs> um, so nutrition361.com, uh, you can email me there. Send me questions, you know, I'm happy to answer. I, I will answer any of your questions. I was wondering how you got that name. Yeah, it was funny. I actually saw, it was a former NBA player was playing in China and there was a shoe company called 361 Degrees. And I'm like, oh, let me look, it was available, it was $12. And yeah. I was going back and forth with somebody for Nutrition 360 and they started at 10 grand. And I'm like, this isn't the year 2000, domains don't matter that much anymore. So I'm not doing that. Yeah. You know, um, so, um, so, yeah, so that's how that ended up. But yeah, send me questions. Um, I have a consultation form on my website. I always tell clients it's, it'll just get you an obligation free, like 15 minute phone call to talk about your goals and see if I'm the right coach for you and vice versa. You know, um, I only want people that want to work with me. You know, it's not something where you get sold into, you know, you don't FOMO, fear of missing out. Do it because you truly want to and you're ready to change and you're ready to challenge yourself, you know, and um, on the other side of challenges and facing your fears is a lot of happiness that truly is there. So that's how they reach me. Sounds great. And I'm going to bring you back on the program again to talk about more of uh, workout programs sure. and, and maybe even another one for jujitsu 101 and how that can help people. Because I'll tell you what, one of the best ways to work out that I found is learning a skill. And, and during an hour jujitsu class, I'm burning 1200 calories. So it's, it's pretty intense and it's a lot of fun. And, uh, and I'm telling you, all of it adds up and all of a sudden I'm learning a life skill that, that I never knew before. Anyone can do jiu-jitsu. It is problem solving on a physical level. It's for, it's for everybody. It's great. If you have kids, man, let them try it. You, you know, it's, it's terrific. I, I, can't, I could talk all about yeah. jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and you hear people talk about jiu-jitsu and it sounds like these people are crazy. It's like, 
you know, well, it's you, the, get a, you get the bug though. You're yeah. right. So yeah. As, as the quote goes, there's a quote, there's a guy, Ryan Hall, a great jujitsu guy. And he says, most people don't think jujitsu be, but it do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks again for watching. Follow Not Almost There, subscribe, leave your comments. If there's a topic that you'd like us to get into, I'd love to hear it. I see John four to five times a week as is. So I'll bring the cameras out and we'll shoot another one of these. But right now we do have to go because we do have to get rolling. Yeah, literally, so, jiu -jitsu. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna get into that. But again, thank you, have a great week. And remember, you, we, me are not almost there.